Disney's California Adventure might not be regarded as the best theme park in the world, but with additions like Buena Vista Street, Cars Land, and Mission Breakout, this has become something pretty great. It did not start out that way though. When the park opened in 2001, it was a hot mess. Just six weeks ago, I was a hot mess. Not only did a lot of it suck, but it sucked in fascinatingly horrible ways. Every single corner you turn, you would see something that would just beg another question. And every time, that question would be, why? Just, why? So let's take a look at the baffling original version of Disney's California Adventure. Mm. <laughs> Wanna go for a spin? <laughs> Michael Eisner might be the most fascinating CEO Disney has ever had. You see, he saved the company and did some truly amazing things with the park. But, his time could be a bit of a mixed bag since most of his big projects were motivated by one thing. Spite. The Living Seas was made to spite SeaWorld, Hollywood Studios was made to spite Universal, Animal Kingdom was made to spite Bush Gardens and Larry Park Zoo, and California Adventure was made to spite, you guessed it, the entire state of California. See, he noticed that a lot of people who were visiting Disneyland from out of state only spent part of their time at the theme parks, and spent the rest of the time exploring the rest of the state. So, when it came time to make a second gate for the resort, he wanted to try and replicate some of the famous sites from around the state of California, so that way no one would ever have a reason to leave the Disney bubble. I mean, why would anyone want to see the real Hollywood if they can just ride Superstar Limo? There's Regis Philbin! <laughs> That's my final answer! <laughs> so yeah, take that, California. Successfully spite it. Beyond just spite, something else motivate California Adventure's design. Hang on, side note. Disney's California Adventure is such a clunky name. It's nine syllables. Like, nine whole syllables. That's twice the amount of syllables in most of the theme box. Three times as many as Disneyland! What the crap is up with that stupid name? Alright, back on topic. Something else motivated DCA's design. Saving money. Every part of it was designed as cheaply as possible, with multiple opening day attractions being literally just ads. Meaning that the theming that makes a theme park a theme park was done as cheaply and as simply as possible, with rides being cut or replaced with cheap alternatives in every single land, and the lands themselves being built around themes that were cheaper to do, like a seaside pier or a movie studio, which neither of those are necessarily bad themes, but they can be done a lot cheaper than more immersive themes like, say, a Wild West village with mountains, or the depths of Southeast Asia. These weren't the only issues with the park, though. Arguably, the entire concept is broken as very core. Cool. See, a California-themed theme park is almost impossible for Disney to do because there's so few Disney properties that take place in California, which means you can't really smoothly integrate the types of characters that people come to expect from Disney parks, that people want from Disney. In fact, the most famous commercial for the park, which I'm showing you now, is full of characters who are almost entirely absent from the actual park. They knew that what people wanted, they were not going to have, so they made an ad pretending they were there. It's insane, and the only ride that was based on any Disney movies on opening day was a loosely themed carousel. So, we're left with a Disney park with next to no connection to Disney, a dumb name built on a tiny budget designed to spite the very state that is being built in. What could possibly go wrong? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> The most notable thing about the entrance to the park back in 2001 was the giant letters that spelled out California, which is really helpful for anyone who has already forgotten what state they're currently in. But reminding idiots of the current geographical location is not the reason the letters are here. See all the different parts of the entrance come together to form a giant postcard for the state of California, and I actually think it's a really cool idea. Celebrating the history of tourism and travel and all in California in a really creative way, 
I like that. Of course, like everything in California Adventure, anything good is simply the cheese in a quesadilla surrounded by a tortilla of terribleness. See, the postcard effect only works from very specific angles, so for most guests, the entrance is just a collection of random California-themed things with seemingly no purpose or visual theme, which does make it kind of fitting for the park as a whole now that I think about it. The coolest part of the entrance, though, is the Golden Gate Bridge. Not only do guests get to walk directly under it, but they can see the monorail go right over it, making this a perfect blend of classic Disney Park iconography with the classic California iconography. It's great! Which means that the Tortilla of Terribleness will be here any second now! Because, you know, when you see this entrance in the monorail, it would get you really excited to ride the monorail, right? With it being such a distinct and noteworthy part of the entrance, it has to be a part of the park, right? I mean, how stupid would it be to incorporate the monorail as a major part of the park entrance and then not have it in California Adventure, right? Ah, there you are. I knew we'd find you soon, Mr. Tortilla. <laughs> the monorail only has two stations. One inside of Disneyland Park and Tomorrowland, the other on the far side of Downtown Disney, which is about as far away from California Adventure as you can get. Nothing at all actually inside California Adventure. <sighs> we aren't even inside the park yet. Alright, the first land in the park is Sunshine Plaza, and back when California Adventure opened in 2001, this was sort of the main street USA of the park basically just some gift shops, some food stands, things like that, or some vague California theming. It was eventually completely demolished to make way for Buena Vista Street and around like the 2012 major update they did to California. So it wasn't exactly well received as an entrance land, all that you judge from these pictures if it's the fun kind of tacky or the ugly kind of tacky. But the main shop here is California Zephyr. It's a really cool and creative setup for a store, actually, and if this was well executed, this would definitely be the fun kind of tacky, the kind of tacky you want from a Disney park. See, it's supposed to all be housed in a train, with each compartment being a different shop. The problem is that the train theme never really was fully executed, and was mostly just a neat facade. The illusion really falls apart from nearly every angle because there was little to no effort put in place try and hide the train is just the door into the shop. Look, the fake train tracks on the floor of this toy store go through the fake train. Like they couldn't even keep it separated from the part of it that was vaguely themed as a train. That's how lazy this was. <sighs> Nothing illustrates just how lazily executed this effect is, and how little was done to try and hide the show building that houses the main store than simply showing this picture. Keep in mind, this is the angle you see the California Zephyr stores from as you enter the park. This is the first impression of them, is this giant, unthemed building with the train stuck on the side and a big tacky sign. The last real noteworthy part of Sunshine Plaza is the sun icon. Sun icon, despite its name, is not the most iconic sun in the park nor is it either the official icon of the park, or the unofficial one adopted by fans. Plus, it looks like a spray-painted hubcap. Alright, let me tell you about Golden State and how messed up it is. You see, Golden State is such an inconsistent and poorly thought out land, that it has six different sub-lands. Six! Usually if a land in a theme park has more than like, two, maybe three sublands, people start to go, boy, that seems excessive, maybe be a little more cohesive next time. Dividing one themed land into six different sections that are too small or weak or poorly thought out to stand on their own is virtually unheard of. Golden State was never really a land, it was a dumping ground of whatever random ideals they had that couldn't fit anywhere else. But. The guide maps call this a land, so technically speaking, the next land in California Adventure at opening day was Golden State. The first sub-land we'll talk about is the Bay Area. 
the only thing really of note yet was Golden Dreams. This attraction is a film based on the history of California. It uses a mythical figure of Queen Calafia, played by Whoopi Goldberg, as a framing device to tell these stories. We see her interact with key moments in the state's history, and it's not a bad movie as a short film, but it's still just a history film for the state of California inside a theme park. And that's kind of its fatal flaw. It's not filled with state-of-the-art animatronics like American Adventure Hall of Presidents, nor is it presented in a unique format like the SocoVision movies from Tomorrowland or Epcot. No, no, no. The budget for those kinds of things will cut, which means any plans to make the show special got cut too. Instead of an immersive pre-show and theater and awesome effects that would make this short history film into a theme park attraction, we have a decently high quality film you'd expect to see at the local museum rather than taking up prime real estate in the center of the newest Disney theme park. Overall, not bad, but still kind of a letdown, especially given the location of the theater and just how big it is. Next up is Bountiful Valley Farms, found inside the subland. Bountiful Valley Farms. Really, uh, really putting a lot of effort on these names, huh? Someone have to stay all weekend walking overtime to get that name in for the deadline? Well, if you think the name is bad, you're going to love what this attraction actually is. Bountiful Valley Farms is a display of farm equipment. And some flowers. And some old farm equipment. And farm equipment merchandise. And that's about it. Why? It's the magic of Disney right here. This was a thing. An actual thing that was advertised as an opening day attraction. A big old ad for Caterpillar. Not even an ad turned into a ride like old school Epcot with all their sponsors. Or an ad turned into an interesting museum or walkthrough. No, this is just a display of farm equipment. Advertised as an opening day attraction in Disney's California Adventure. It's the very first thing listed on the guide maps back in 2001. Experience the magic of Disney by taking a picture near a regular tractor. Buy a cat hat. <sighs> oh, uh, that was difficult. Alright, I'm good. I'm good. I gotta get out of my system. Okay. We are! We are! Next door to Bountiful Valley Farms was It's Tough to Be a Bug, a 3D movie borrowed from Animal Kingdom. Instead of being housed in a really amazingly detailed and iconic theater like the Tree of Life, California Adventure has it inside a building with an ad for Bountiful Valley Farms, the display of farm equipment painted on the side. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills! There's a lot of sponsored ad attractions in the Golden State area of the park. There are either small displays or short movies, so I'm gonna speed through this a little bit. Learn about wine. Learn about sourdough bread. Learn about tortillas. No, not you. Regular, plain, old-fashioned, plain, regular tortillas. So much of the opening day lineup was just ads. Though the one for the bread is actually still there to this day and gives out free samples, so it isn't all bad. But unfortunately, Golden State, at least in 2001, was shaping up to be pretty terrible. But, Golden State also housed two of the park's best attractions. Soren has been added to nearly every Disney resort around the world and is always a hugely popular fan favorite. And this one, the original, is usually regarded as the best in the world. A deceptively simple simulator ride where you gently soar over the state of California. It's breathtaking. After that, you can continue on to tour the lovely wooded area, which includes the Grand Californian Resort and Hotel, which borders the park and adds to the theming in a really unique way. This whole section of California Adventure is based on Northern California and the state and national parks up that way. This is where you find the original icon of the park, Grizzly Peak. This bear-shaped mountain hosts it Grizzly River Run, which is a pretty great river rabbits ride and wraps all around Grizzly Peak. And then next to that, there's the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail, which is a great mix of a walkthrough and a play area. All in all, this whole side of Golden State is easily the best part of the park, as it has cohesive theming, 
creative set pieces, great landscapes, multiple fun attractions that hold up to the high standards set by Disney, it's all good cheese with no tortilla of terribleness in sight. We have reached the peak of California Adventure. And you know what reaching the peak means. Paradise Pier recently received some major renovations to become Pixar Pier. But before the retheme, Paradise Pier was pretty beloved for the way it recreated the charming Victorian era seaside amusement parks of the 1920s. This beloved version of Paradise Pier was not what guests found on opening day. That was a result of a series of changes between 2008 and 2012. The original Paradise Pier that greeted guests back in 2001 was perfectly and immersively themed to a cheesy, slightly run-down, little bit tacky, present-day seaside boardwalk amusement park. It is primarily based on the famous and iconic Santa Monica Pier, which is literally only a 45-minute drive away and costs less than half the price of a ticket to California Adventure. It would be like if Epcot opened a World Showcase Pavilion based on Lakeland, Florida. Come check it out, we got lakes! And land! Yay? There's a bunch of flat rides and small attractions in Paradise Pier, and I'm not going to go into all of them. See, the amusement park theme gave Disney an easy out to add a bunch of loosely themed off-the-shelf rides. In case you don't know, off-the-shelf basically means that these are standard stock rides that can be bought by any carnival, state fair, or amusement park. One or two of these are a great way to round out a park that has an underwhelming lineup without adding much to the budget. These can become classics like Dumbo or Teacup with just a little bit of Disney magic added in. They can be really fun and really charming, and they only start to cheapen the experience when you get more than like three or four in the same area. Paradise Pier had six. Maybe eight depending on how strict you are on what counts. Like I said, I'm not going to go into all of them, but I'm going to give you some highlights. The Orange Stinger was a spinning swing ride inside a giant orange full of bees. Bees? Something that made it unique was special seats designed to make it look like the guests themselves wore bees. Bees? These seats were so poorly designed that they were removed within 13 days because they were falling apart. 13 days! Less than two weeks! You can't make this stuff up! Bees? Nearby was the Malaboomer, a drop tower theme to the strength test carnival games next to a bunch of actual midway games so Disney can take your money. Malaboomer has, in my opinion, a stronger pun on the name Malibu than Malaburrito, a food stand so unpopular it was notorious for staying closed nearly 365 days a year. But the real tragedy is that Malaboomer and Malaburrito aren't next to each other to create a lame Malibu pun named Subland within Paradise Pier, the Malaboro. Come on, Disney. It was right there. So obvious. Not far from that was Mahalan Madness, a mousetrap-style coaster themed to the famously curvy road, Mahalan Drive. The theming was not the most immersive in Disney history, but that's okay, because the ride itself was also nothing special, so it fits. The two biggest things in Paradise Pier are the Sun Wheel and California Screaming. The Sun Wheel is basically a giant Ferris wheel, except for the cabins swing around these cracks, creating the most terrifying ride in any Disney park. Though it does add to the immersive California theming of California Adventure and the California Seaside Pier by being a near-perfect replica of the Wonder Wheel from Coney Island in New York. I wasn't kidding when I said that every single part of California Adventure has something insane about it, like having one of the icons be based on something from New York. Of course, the most famous part of Paradise Pier was California Screaming. It's a launch coaster, it has multiple inversions, it's real nice, thrilling, extreme, though I would argue it's far less intense than the Sun Wheel, but that could just be the childhood trauma talking. It's nice, it's thrilling, it's fun, it's got a great soundtrack, overall it's a pretty great ride. Don't worry though, if you spend too much time thinking about California Screaming, you'll realize that it's just as baffling and bizarre as the rest of the park. 
You see, this ride is a steel roller coaster themed as an unthemed wooden roller coaster and a land themed as an unthemed seaside pier. And as Kevin Perglio of the Funkland would say, California themed theme park to be located in the already California themed California. Why? What? Why? Look, there's so many layers of terrible decisions and needless complications here, and everywhere in this park. Every level of opening day California adventure is just insane. It's like if the Cats movie was a theme park. And we still have one last land to talk about. And I've saved the worst for last. It only gets weirder from here. In an earlier version of this script, I was going to start the section on Hollywood Pictures' backlot by discussing how the designs carved into these elephant statues that are at the entrance to the land make it look as if these elephants have been skinned alive. I mean, look at them and tell me that those don't look like muscle tissue. But, as with everything in this park, the more I researched it, the crazier I realized it was. See, the elephants are based on the Babylon set from the movie Intolerance in 1916, film which was such a bloated box office bomb that bankrupted the studio and led to the director spending the rest of his life in financial ruin. There wasn't even enough money left to take down the extravagant sets, which were instead left to rot for nearly a decade before they were deemed a fire hazard and removed by the city. These elephants are a literal monument to failure, and I can't think of a more perfect metaphor for California adventure as a whole, but especially Hollywood Pictures Backlot, home of perhaps the two worst attractions Disney has ever created. There's Regis Hilton, and that's my final answer. To start with, the theming in this land is very confused. Is this meant to be a set? A uh, back lot? Well then why are the buildings puns instead of semi-realistic city streets like the streets of America over at Disney World? Are these meant to be real streets? Is this a weird stylistic alternate universe built on attempts at self-referential humor? Well then why are some parts of it clearly set? Why is the facade for Superstar Limo not fit as part of a set or as a real street despite being a big icon here? This art style doesn't fit anything else in the land. Why the ugly animal print awnings? The real life building this is based on doesn't have those. What Imagineer decided that this building's awnings should look like something Joe Exotic would wear, instead of, you know, like awnings? How come the entrance elephants are themed to the old Hollywood 1920s era, when the rest is about in trendy, modern, glitzy Hollywood? Is this whole land meant to be a celebration of the Hollywood that never was and always will be? Or is it a scathing indictment of the studio culture that Disney is a king of? What is anything supposed to be here? I mean, the land isn't cohesive with any specific idea, visual style, or thematic purpose. It's just a collection of scattered ideas with no follow-through or commitment. And it tries so hard to be so many different things that it just winds up being nothing. A studio theme is probably the easiest and cheapest to pull off of any theme ever, and this isn't even the first time Disney has done it. How did they screw this up? The only thing that would be harder for Disney to screw up than a studio themed area would be a musical review where people sing a bunch of Disney songs. Steps in Time is a musical review where people sing a bunch of Disney songs, and it's been described as deeply unsettling and horrible. This show doesn't get talked about a lot and is usually overshadowed by Superstar Limo in terms of being legendarily bad, but I'd argue that the show is somehow the real worst traction that Disney has ever made. It could easily be the subject of this video just on its own. There's just so much here that I'm not going to go into all the disturbing or weird details or the fascinating history behind this show. I will say that Steps in Time features actual child actors live on stage. 
a mini scud wearing uncomfortably flirty fairy godmother, and one of the actual children singing a duet of a whole new world, Disney's most romantic song ever, with the mini scud wearing uncomfortably flirty fairy godmother. Park where one of the two main complaints from people was a lack of Disney characters, and where this was one of the only attractions featuring Disney characters, Steps in Time was so hated that closed in less than a year. Next up is Superstar Limo, and there's not much to say about this ride that hasn't already been said a thousand times by a thousand different other people on YouTube. It was horrible. It was misguided. It was built to cater to Eisner's ever-changing desires with a constantly shrinking budget, and had a bad idea to start with, and the execution was even worse, to the point that Eisner's cameo that was planned was replaced with an ugly puppet, because he didn't want to be associated with the ride. He also had some mean-spirited jokes that were aimed at Disney's rivals, like DreamWorks, removed the last minute, because it's tough to not just look sad when you're teasing someone if this is the medium you're using to do it. In the park where one of the two main complaints was a lack of rides accessible to really young kids, and while this was one of the only rides accessible to really young kids, Superstar Limo was so hated that it closed in less than a year. And there wasn't even a plan to replace it. This ride was just so horrible that it improved California Adventure by just being an empty building in a dead end of the park for several years instead of remaining open. And that was basically it for Hollywood Pictures Backlot on opening day. There wasn't much here, and what was here has gone down in history as some of the worst stuff that Disney has ever made. It's insane to me that the display of farm equipment wasn't the worst thing in this park. That it went downhill from there. Superstar Limo, Steps in Time, and really California Adventure as a whole back when it opened, paint a picture of everything that was wrong with the Eisner era of the Disney parks. It was misguided attempts to be hip and trendy, crazy ideals without the budget to make them work, and a desire to spite, well, everyone. Nearly every single part of California Adventure, other than Grizzly Peak, has been redone and rethemed since then. There's not a single land from opening day that hasn't been reimagined, renamed, or rebuilt entirely. In just under 20 years, the entire park has essentially been replaced with a completely new version of it. Something entirely unprecedented for a major theme park. But, even with all that, I have to say, and you know perhaps this is just a Stockholm Syndrome talking, but this early version of California Adventure, as baffling and often terrible as it was, it had a real personality. It had a unique charm that didn't feel like anything else Disney had done. It was definitely a park full of mistakes and bad ideals, but there was something truly special here too. It's a really fascinating park, and has grown so much over the years and become something pretty amazing. But Disney's California Adventure started off truly baffling. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Now let me know in the comments what baffling history you'd like to see me discuss next, and subscribe so you don't miss it. If you're interested in learning more, I have a lot of resources in the description with great info on theme park history. Thanks for watching.